Welcome to the Soul Seeker Podcast. I'm your host, Sam Kabert, and this year marks the fifth birthday of the Soul Seeker Podcast. I started this pod back in 2019 when I was taking my first steps on the path of remembering. And at the time, the tagline for the show was a journey of self discovery. A year later, it became a journey of remembering. Yet, what I know now is back then I was still seeking. And what I've come to know now is that it's the journey of seeking that brings us the silent, slow stillness of acceptance. And therein lies our own innate wisdom. It's my mission now to eradicate the glorification of hustle culture, as it was my drive in entrepreneurship that led to a greater whole. And that's because I was outsourcing my sovereignty rather than looking within. So let this be your invitation to take a deep breath in and remember that at any time we can shift our thoughts and our feelings to create the outer world in which we wish to live. Soul Seekers, it's time to grow. Let's go. Super pumped to record this podcast here with my man, Terry Bowman, and we are going to talk about so many different things, mainly breath work and men's groups and all the things. But before we do, as always, let's just ground in with some breath. So if you're in a space that you feel safe to close your eyes, I invite you to close your eyes, but otherwise you can just breathe with us just a few breaths. So beginning to shut down the eyes. Going from the chaotic and busy outer world into our inner landscape, feeling the feet on the floor, and slowly through the nose, inhaling all the way up. Sipping in a bit more air at the top, holding the breath here. And audible sigh, let it go, let it go, let it go. And another big inhale as we let the belly expand and bringing that breath all the way up. Sipping in a bit more air at the top, holding the breath, maybe rolling the eyes up as if you were to look at the third eye. And slowly exhaling, belly to spine, shoulders drop. And one last one. Biggest breath yet, inhaling all the way up. Sipping in a bit more at the top. Sipping a bit more. Hold the breath, rolls, roll the eyes up. And exhaling. All right, flickering the eyes back open. Here we are. Terry, in a word or two, how are you feeling, brother? Uh, feeling good, man. I'm a couple of days uh, out of surgery on my bicep tendon, and so I could be could be better, but I could be a lot worse. So I'm feeling pretty good today. Yeah, let's start there. I saw that in your story. I was like, "You still good to record?" I think I saw a bone popping out, like it was a chicken uh, yeah, bone. That, that was the tendon. The uh, surgeon here in Costa Rica actually took a couple of picks during surgery. Yeah. Uh, so yeah, I I was uh. Jiu-jitsu injury maybe three or four weeks ago. I slapped hands with the dude to start and reached for his leg and tore my bicep tendon. Wow. So uh, I think it was a slight injury then, and then I was doing a Krav Maga demo and picked a guy up and went to sit him down and finished it off. So it was uh, went to see the doctor and had surgery the next day. That's wild. And I don't know that much about you. I'm super grateful for our mutual friend, Tim Jackson, for yeah. connecting us. And and uh, one of the things that I believe I read was you're a former professional MMA fighter. Is that right? Yeah, I was. Uh, I, I started with professional boxing and then I kickboxed for the World Combat League. I fought for the New York Clash and then did some MMA. And have, for the last probably seven or eight years, I've competed IBJF uh, Brazilian Jiu Jitsu. Uh, I turned 50 back in May. So I'm nice. thinking about uh, slowing down on the competition stuff, but I still love to train um, as much as I can. 
Incredible. Yeah. And I, I will probably unpack that and talk a little bit more how you might utilize that with your men's groups, but let's just get into Costa Rica living. Cause you mentioned to me that you were living in Tennessee. I think you mentioned like 20 years and from North Carolina and you moved to Costa Rica just several years ago, full time in Nassara, right? My favorite area out there. Tell us a little bit about that decision to move to Costa Rica and what the transition has been like. Yeah, man, I came uh, for the first time, like for Christmas, New Year's of 2016 with a couple of buddies. I'd never heard of Nosada, Costa Rica. And, um, you know, they like to surf, that kind of thing. I love to travel. So I was, yeah, let's do it. And then I came, we loved it. And then we wanted to come back the next year. And I was actually getting ready for a Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu tournament. I was a couple of weeks out. I was like, I can go on the trip, but I got to, I got to train. So I found a place called Jungle's Edge that, you know, they were doing jujitsu and I got to train and the guy started talking to me about doing retreats, hosting retreats. He found out that I had a couple of Krav Maga studios uh, back in Tennessee and, and gyms. And he said, have you ever thought about doing retreats? And I'm like, no, but I love to, you know, do it. And, and even, even if I could get like a free vacation. Uh, so I, I, within that year, I, I started doing my first retreat, had like three guys, uh, and then the next one had six and nine and it started to grow. Um, uh, and I had an investor at the time that was interested in, in, you know, maybe doing something here in Costa Rica. So we decided we were going to, you know, buy a retreat center. Uh, my plan was to still just basically go back and forth, maybe be here once a week, uh, or once a month for a few months of the year. Uh, that deal ended up falling through. And by that time I was like madly in love with Nosada and Costa Rica. And so I kept, you know, pushing and in 2019, uh, my wife and her parents, they actually helped us get this place, uh, where we are now, Casas Kismet. It was just a couple of houses with a little rancho and we've turned it into the retreat center space that it is now. Uh, there's the monkeys. Um, that timing was amazing timing for real estate in Costa Rica, but it was the scariest, worst timing possible for buying a property in another country, uh, needing people to come here, uh, when they close the borders, they close the borders for eight months. So I was like, fuck, what have I done? You know, we've we've messed up. Plus, I had gyms in the States that were closing down with the restrictions and the lockdowns. Uh, but through the whole, you know, COVID climate, you know, once the, the uh, borders opened back up in October, I was like, if I'm going to get stuck somewhere, I want to get stuck in Costa Rica. So we sold everything we had and, and moved here uh, like in October of 20. 21 yeah 21 oh, nice that was the second time i visited costa rica or yeah so costa rica second time november of 2021 i did my yoga teacher training just up the street from you at the bodhi tree with oh the cool yoga. yeah, yeah. yeah. That's, that's really when i fell in love with costa rica so it, it seems so glamorous from the outside you know and i've thought about it several times like I would love to just pick everything up and move out there. What are some of, uh, just to be real, like some of the every day or maybe not every day, just some of the challenges that you face? Uh, uh, with the transition? Yeah, man. So many people move here. We say it's where relationships and cars come to die. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, so many people move here because you do, you have the beaches and the wildlife and the nature and, you know, it is a lot more peaceful. It's a much slower pace. Uh, and I love all of that. For some people, it's too slow, right? I can't get on Amazon and order a package, right? That's going to be delivered. I don't have a mailbox, um, you know, at least once a week. My car isn't going to start. It's going to have a flat tire, you know, in rainy season, everything molds. Hmm. You know, there's a lot. It's just 
there's not a really a nightlife to speak of. Um, you know, people ask me all the time, like, oh, is there a lot, a lot going on? I'm like, not really. Like, not much to do. I'm like, man, nah, not really. But I, it's hard to explain. You either love it or hate it. And I love it. I mean, I love just waking up in the morning, being able to take my dogs to the beach, walking on the beach. You know, there's not a bunch of hotels and all that stuff. It's a, you know, it's mostly jungle uh, because we're protected by the turtle reserve. Uh, so you can't build within 200 meters of the of the ocean. So it's just a totally different vibe, different feel. Uh, I'm going to the States on Monday. I've got my kids back in the States. I have a 21 and 27 year old uh, son. So I like to go see them every two or three months. So I get kind of immersed back into the culture of the U.S. But just driving on the interstate is like insane to me because you really don't get above like 40 here so mm -hmm. just just that i mean everything's so fast and so loud and so chaotic uh i just i really in hindsight don't know how to did it for you know 40 plus years i could imagine that because the first two times i was in costa i was there for a month each time the third time only a few days but um yeah, even just being there for a month, it was culture shock coming back. And last year, I went to Bali for the first time. Have you been there? I haven't. My wife has a teacher training actually there next year. So I'm hoping to visit next September. Oh, sweet. Cool. Yeah. I mean, everyone, it seems like loves Bali for me. You know, I wanted to go to Costa Rica and then I decided to go to Bali instead. And I felt like Bali was more chaotic when you're talking about like getting on the intersection or the highways and the freeways, like just all the scooters and the construction and the honking and so many people. Cause I mean, I live in Santa Cruz and, and kind of out in the cuts and uh, pleasure point away from everything. So, you know, it's, it's kind of like our little version of Nassara or Costa Rica, if you will. You know, it's not city life. And I, I definitely uh, resonate with what you're saying. And we can't hear it, the howling monkeys, but <laughs> the mic doesn't pick that up. But the oh, sounds of the monkeys and the locusts, oh, it's it's amazing. I love it. Yeah, man, it's it's uh, it's different. But I, I never imagined myself living in the middle of the jungle, but I love it. Yeah, for sure. So let's talk a little bit about men's groups and the men's work that you do. It sounds like if I'm connecting the dots that you started to lead the retreats out in Costa Rica and you're mostly, mostly working with them. Was it more like, I, I'm not even a fighter, jujitsu, like jujitsu style? Yeah, more Led like more fitness, so. fitness, Krav Maga, like it was kind of a fitness martial arts retreat. Um, I have since morphed into these men's retreats, which, you know, I've taught, um, I've taught self-defense and martial arts my whole life. I mean, it's pretty much all I've done since I was 20 years old. I've worked at different martial arts studios and, um, academies, but, and then owned my own for 15 years, but there's just something about working with men. Uh, we're still do. You know, our first day, we're introing them to boxing. There's so many guys who have never been punched in the face or never tried to hit somebody or, you know, and it's not about the skill necessarily of the fighting as much as it is just the the camaraderie and the bonding of like doing this super masculine thing mm -hmm. uh, and teaching these guys skills if they did have to protect themselves they at least have some general idea of what it feels like to be hit a little bit what it feels like to make contact aggressively with somebody else super tranquilo you know nobody's a cage fighter by the end of the week mm -hmm. uh, but uh it's a really cool experience and then the second day uh we intro them to jujitsu because you know most the fights end up on the ground and and you have to know that element of and the jujitsu uh, i mean i've taught krav maga for years it's what the israeli military teaches oh wow it's muay thai kickboxing brazilian jujitsu uh all those arts but it's more of a self-defense street military mindset on defending like self pure self-defense mm -hmm. um and for years i was like oh it's krav maga or nothing and and 
you know, the thing that jujitsu gives you, especially in the States is there's so many academies. There's so many people that do it. It allows you to have the fight feeling you get to put on your pajamas and roll with a guy and, and use your strength and technique and, and feel this, you feel the fight feeling. You know, Krav Maga uses a lot of eye gouges and groin kicks and elbows to the, you know, so there's not a real safe way to practice. You know, we do like MMA type sparring, but even that, like guys don't want to go to the, you know, with the black eyes and the busted lips and noses. And so I, I do think jujitsu is a great art form for men you know, to go back and join a jujitsu academy and feel like they get the exercise, they get the cardiovascular and they get the skill set. So we intro those, uh, the, the jujitsu the second day, um, typically the, by the third day of the retreat, uh, we do a pretty, I don't want to say aggressive. It's a good hike. It's uh, an hour and a half down the mountain to a year round waterfall at my buddy's property. And then it's about an hour and a half out and it's steep and it's, you know, it's a challenge, but we're really trying to get these guys, uh, break them down a little bit physically in the beginning. We kind of front load the physical. Uh, and then we come back on that Tuesday and have what's called a death ceremony where you're basically laying there with a eye mask on and, and the narrator's asking questions like you're on your deathbed and you have, you know, this death and then you kind of get to wake back up and start anew and fresh. And then that um, third or fourth day is typically medicine day. We do plant medicine on that day uh, for those that can do it. Um and it's just super hard opening, you know, we do acacia and psilocybin and the guys are just wide open. So all the walls that maybe they came in with are usually down by then. And they trust each other because they've done the boxing and they've done the jujitsu and they've done the breath work. And, and so, so you've really, you know, we've cracked a lot of walls by then. Uh, and then we also do like instinctive archery, uh, the holotropic breath work, um, you know, there's a co like this, you know, Costa Rican cooking experience. It's a lot of stuff, but, um, the, the, the martial arts and the physical is a big part of it. Yeah. Thank you for laying out all the days. It's, it's cool to see like the full evolution of the journey. And, and I can see there's a lot of intentionality that goes into that. I'm curious what type of guys are typically uh, coming to the retreat. Like, are they more guys that have been into fighting or people that are new into fighting? Like what's kind of their background? I don't think I've had trying to think if i've had anybody even with any real there's been a couple of guys who train a little bit maybe they are already doing jujitsu um but most of most of these guys are brand new i mean the truth is most men and you know myself i'm not above this but most guys you know even if we don't train we've never been in a fight we think somehow magically we're going to turn into Jason Bourne when something happens. <laughs> but the truth is a lot of men have that little inner voice that is the realist saying, Hey bro, you don't actually train. You don't actually know what to do in a situation. Uh, and I think that's a rub for a lot of guys. I think that's a, that's a something inside them um, that they want to, um, you know, that they want not, not necessarily fix, but they, they, they want to be able to know, even if they're not like a championship fighter, that they do have the ability to protect themselves, to protect their family, to stand up for themselves or someone else if they needed to. Mm -hmm. And uh, you know, yeah. What was that? Keep going. It's, it's very empowering. It's an empowering. Yeah. It, being which i just gotta say is by the way i love that the title of your retreat is the balanced man and it, for whatever you and i weren't connected but in january of 2022 when i came back from nasara and started teaching yoga i started leading a men's group i called mine the balanced man so uh, we definitely have some resonance there i love that and i'm, I'm curious your thoughts on this because when 
I see, hear, read, learn about men's work. It seems like there's a few different styles of men's work. And a lot of what's out there seems to be like kind of um, step into your manhood, you know, like from boy to man type of rite of passage. And I've always kind of resonated more with the softening side of being like, no, I've been in my aggressive, um, we could call it whatever out of balance or toxic, whatever you want to call it, whatever terms, it doesn't really matter. Masculine, uh, um, with that, I wouldn't say that I am there in terms of like the physicality and physicality, especially the fighting. And what it feels like uh, the way you're approaching it is it's kind of that in between because a, a lot of the like raw, raw masculine type men's work I see, I just get turned off by that, you know, and it yeah. seems like it's a big rite of passage and I'm like, it's more about softening. So what, what, what comes up for you when I bring that topic up? Yeah, for me, you know, initially when I started doing men's work, especially in Osada, it was just like there's a lot of, you know, men's work being done around trauma and, you know, that sort of thing. And I'm like, I mean, all that's great, but would love for these men to learn some actual skills that they can take back to them in their everyday life. Um, and so my, my original approach was a little more hardcore, you know, some of these are like super like Navy SEAL trained guys that are going through hell for a week and, and getting punished, you know, I, that's not really my jam. Um, I wanted it to be where we're empowering these guys and we're teaching them some skills. Uh, but then my partner, uh, Aaron, uh, I brought him on. He is the guy that owns the land. And we had a guy who did the hike, who, um, you know, found out he was a couple of days off some really strong methamphetamines and, and, you know, was struggling. He was falling asleep on the way down the hike down the mountain so if wow. you're having to sit down and rest on the way down you are pretty screwed coming back and just the way that Aaron showed up how because I'm very much like let's go you got this get your shit on let's you know he kind of balances that out we balance each other out and and you know he was so patient with the guy yet stern to not let him sit down um you know, and to keep going because he didn't want him to lose the blood in his legs and all that is just the way he showed up in that moment um, with this real stoic masculine present, but so, so patient and compassionate. And I was like, this guy needs to be my partner. So I actually brought him on and the balanced man truly did become balanced in that moment. Um, so, you know, for us, again, I don't want, I mean, there is a time and a need for trauma work and shadow work and, and, you know, but for us, we're not really trying to bring up a bunch of old stuff. Like, yeah, you, maybe you were abused as a kid or this happened or that happened and you have some trauma, see it, own it, recognize it. And let's, how do, how, how do we cope? in our day-to-day -day lives and not let that be a determining factor. So um, for us, it's more about empowering these guys with the self-defense stuff. And then we also, a big part of our retreat is this idea of a morning practice, owning your morning. So we're on the floor every morning at 5 a.m. And that usually starts with um, a daily stretch. Like I've been, I'm, you know, I'm 50. I've been a fighter my, for 30 years. I have rarely stretched, right? I'm like, ah, well, I'll stretch while I'm training, mm -hmm. you know, murder yoga, let's go. And that's jujitsu, by the way, murder yoga, if you ever, <laughs> if you ever hear that term again. Um, so, but I started doing this morning stretch, like 10 minutes every morning. I do this stretch routine and I've gotten so much more flexible than trying to go to a yoga class or something that I'm not going to go to on a regular basis. Uh, and that that's because of the morning practice. So I get up every morning, 10 to 15 minute stretch, you know, uh, 
five to 10 minute meditation or breath work. Uh, I typically do breath work because I resonate a lot with breath work. Uh, I struggle to meditate. Uh, and then journaling or a workout or a yoga, like it can, it, there's no fixed thing that we're doing, if that makes sense. We're not yeah. writing a prescription. We're just, we've created this container where guys are introduced to a bunch of different modalities that they can kind of pick and choose from to create their own lifestyle, their own routine, um, and the morning practice, I think, by far is the biggest thing that they can take home with them. Yeah, I, I so resonate with that. I know for me, like when I'm off my game, I was sharing with you before we hit record, just kind of coming through some dark times. And, you know, um, when I'm off, I let my morning and evening routine go. But when my evening routine is dialed in, then my morning routine is dialed in. And when my morning routine is dialed in, then I'm dialed in. So I resonate with that deeply. And uh, I, I, lo I love that. That's all great. One thing I want to go back to in terms of the trauma is it's, it's so interesting because we can certainly get lost in like doing the work. And I think a lot of spiritual seekers do get lost in that. I myself include from time to time when you are uh, conducting the medicine ceremony and then the breath work journey with a uh, holotropic breath work, what sorts of uh, emotions and things and outcomes start to generally come up in your retreats for the guys? Yeah. And, and from like, we don't facilitate the medicine. We have professional facilitators that come in, you know, a lot of these guys, you know, they have no idea where the medicine's going to take them, but typically we encourage them to have some sort of intention of where they want to go. Right. Um, and, you know, typically a lot of these guys are, it's all over the board. We've had 20 year olds up to 68 year olds. We've had divorcees. We've had guys doing a career. They just retired or they're looking to change careers or so it could be all over the board with what they're seeking. As far as their intention goes, um, we have had some guys, you know, especially in the medicine ceremonies, you know, realize that, you know, it's a lot of, of, especially with the acacia because it's super heart opening we call it heart medicine you know so it's it's more of an internal dialogue that you have with yourself where somehow you become the smartest person in the room to yourself in your own head uh and they're just seeing maybe arguments that they've had with their wives or disagreements they've had with their kids or you know something that's happened in the workplace where they're viewing it from the other side they're seeing it from the other vantage point and being like, oh man, I was really a dick during that conversation. I couldn't see it in the moment, but because their heart's open and the walls are down and, and, and they can see it from the other side, you know, there's been a lot of, because a lot of that's, the, that's where the healing happens, right? Where we see it from the other side and we have compassion for people and their way of thinking or, or understanding something that we might be so rigid on. And, and so like, you know, why do I feel this way about X, Y, or Z? Um, so the medicine is super powerful in that. The real thing that I love about like holotropic breath work and what made me fall in love with it is pre moving to Costa Rica, like I've never smoked a joint, never smoked a cigarette, don't really drink, you know, grew up Baptist, you know, like super strict. You were either atheist or Baptist, right? Mm. I didn't know, I didn't know about any other religions. Um, so I was very anti drug plant medicine that sort of thing um it wasn't even plant medicine back then to us we didn't have that type yeah, of right, vernacular right, right. you know it's all um, drugs it's yeah. all drugs right yeah. all of it is drugs it's all the same um but i you know i came to find i came to find out that it's more about the intention and the setting and and you know that sort of thing when it comes to these plant medicines but the, the breath work, I've had some huge, like full on journeys, if you will, breakthroughs um, with just the breath, 
And there's unfortunately a lot of guys who come on these retreats who, even if they want to do the medicine and they're willing to participate, they can't because they're already on SSRIs or antidepressants and they, they can't do, they can't do the medicine. So having the breath work um, is a powerful tool that anyone can do and anyone can use is one of the reasons I really fell in love with it. Amazing. And if you could tell us a little bit more about holotropic breath work, because I'm very familiar with the term on a very chunked up high level uh, kind of way, but I have not experienced it personally. And for anyone listening as well, that may not be have experienced holotropic breath work, could you describe uh, it a little bit? Yeah. So really all it means is whole breath. Um, and the guy I'm going to blank on the guy's name. Isn't it Stanislav Grof or? Stanislav Grof. Thank yeah. you. Yes. Stanislav basically was doing LSD trials and either got in trouble or needed a different, needed a different path and then basically created this uh, holotropic breath. But really it's just breathing in more air and faster so it's a very intentional that's breath work i mean it is can be super laborious for for people especially if you're doing a i like to typically do like a seven 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 or seven eight nine you know jogging pace breath um where you're doing two inhales and one exhale there some people do nose mouth some people do nose nose there's you know even There's within no, holotropic breath work, it changes how they change, lead it. Yeah, it changes. Oh, wow. the, one, you know, uh, I think most holotropic breath is the two in and one out. Um, we typically do with like pursed lips, like, and it's the big belly, big yeah. chest, letting go with no break at the bottom, similar to uh, like a Wim Hof. Um, on and the, the exhale is passive. It's not a, a active blow for the exhale, yeah, right? Yeah like really like trying to blow out crazy. Uh, it can become that way if you're doing like a sprint. And you're... Okay. Yeah, like I said, it's a very intense um, breath. But for me, man, I can two or three minutes in and I'm like dropped into a medicine type experience, typically very similar to the acacia um, plant where it's, it's a lot of, I don't see a lot of visuals, but it's super internal conversation with myself um mm -hmm. a lot of enlightening so to speak or realizations and i catch myself oh oh wow you know yeah. that sort of thing so uh i mean i have led quite a few of these now and just i mean people crying you know it's a release and it's not even like a most of the time it's not a sad cry it's like an emotional releasing cry of happiness or realization or or joy um you know I've, I've people the other cool thing is the physical side where you see people releasing like shoulders or hips or legs and they'll start stretching and moving um, because your body now your brain's not telling your body that it can't do something or shouldn't do something uh, and your body knows what it needs to fix or needs to adjust. You know, the human body is to me amazing on this ability that we have uh, to heal, to heal ourselves. Um, and and I always say the breath is the medicine. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I couldn't agree more. And I, I resonate with what you said about meditation as well. And just kind of getting there with breath work. Uh, it's rare these days that I'll sit down in meditation, and not do breath work first, because yeah. to your point of doing a few minutes of any sort of circular connected mouth breathing, it's activating, right? So it gets us to that point where it's like, oh, all those circling thoughts, they just start to go away and you start to access that clarity. Um yeah. Cool. Well, with holotropic breath work, I've heard that traditionally those journeys are like three hours long. Is that true? I have not. I mean, I yes, you're correct. And um, I've seen it and seen videos. We typically go, you know, 45 minutes to an hour in our yeah. uh, treats. It's like I said, it's, it's pretty intense. Um, and I think the three hour type things are more 
trying to go deeper, maybe trying to uncover some trauma, maybe more of a ayahuasca-esque experience. Um, we're really just trying to get people to drop in to that, to that first level. Um, not to say that it wouldn't be amazing to go deeper or whatever, but um, like I said, it's, it's hard enough, I find, to get people to breathe intentionally for mm -hmm. three, seven minute rounds, much less doing it for three hours. No, I feel you. Most of my breath work journeys that I lead are about 45 minutes, uh, 60 yeah. on the long end. And then the everyday, like more maintenance routine type ones that not every day, but more frequent ones I'll lead, maybe like 20 minutes. And then, yeah. you know, the five minutes with uh, activation breath leading into meditation, visualization. But yeah, uh, the reason why I ask is because anytime like, I think about three hours of breath work. I'm like, damn, that seems intense. Like sign me up. I'm down. But uh, at the same time, I can't. Uh, yeah. I'm trying to imagine what that would be like, you know, especially if you have done plant medicine and you know that like you could take plant medicine and drop in in 30 minutes and be on the journey for six hours and it be, and just lay there and kind of enjoy it as opposed to like three hours of basically a workout like a, yeah i mean you know, but again it is a great alternative for people who either don't want to do plant medicine or can yeah absolutely and i being out in santa cruz and you might experience this too with some of the locals there are people that are surfers but being here in santa cruz at least like in my men's group when i would lead uh, breath work journeys. I remember a couple surfers just came in, not really knowing what like men's work or what men's group was or anything. And, you know, tell them a little bit. And then I'm like, Hey, we're going to do breath work too. Afterwards, I could surf a 30 foot wave, you know, um, because the lung capacity. So it really lends itself well to what you're doing with the physicality as well. And I'm curious about the integration because like you are just immersed right there in the jungle with the ocean there. You're taking the guys on a waterfall hike and you can, you're just in the elements. It's so much different. Like that's just an amazing place to integrate these experiences. Like, yeah. is that a piece of um, the experience and something you are helping the guys with as they return home to their quote unquote, like normal life? Yeah. I mean, I, I think it's very hard to, make um dramatic change without changing your environment at least temporarily it's very to me it's very hard to be in i can't imagine having the same experience and we want to do some of these in the u.s and canada and, and different countries but like just you know even in in tennessee i would need to be out in the mountains in a cabin you know, you could have a similar experience for sure, but trying to do it off your back deck or, you know, the the being in the house with your kids or your wife or, or that sort of thing would be super, super hard. Um, I think a big part of the retreat itself, the biggest feedback we get from men on why they enjoy the retreat so much is they don't have to make any decisions for a week. That's the number one by far is like, man, I get to, you tell me when to show up to eat. You tell me when to show up to work out. You tell me when to show up for a men's circle. I don't have to think about anything. And for a lot of men, especially in today's society, that's super important. Um, but yes, definitely having it here in Nosara, Costa Rica, our place uh, is in Palada above La Garda Lodge. So we're on top of this mountain, you know, staring at the Pacific Ocean, we're a 10 minute walk to the beach. Uh, and it's super tranquil, quiet, you just have the jungle sounds. Um, it's a lot easier to drop in here for sure. I'm curious about the decisions part, because that that's not something I really thought about before. But you're right, like, one of the reasons why I love going to trainings and like, and teacher trainings, whatever it might be, is not just the learning, but it's like, I, I, I don't know if I consciously made that connection of I don't need to think about what's next or what I'm doing. And I'm just showing up and I'm a sponge and I'm absorbing. Why do you think that is that? Uh, 
we we feel so good not having to make decisions well think about it even even if let's say i'm in the states you know i'm a dad let's say my kids my two kids are younger right i'm a dad i've got a couple of kids that are you know eight and ten and i finally get a week off from work great but we're gonna go to south we're gonna go to the beach we're gonna go to charleston you know, it's the logistics of getting everything, you know, we're probably driving. I'm probably driving, you know, we got to get everything ready. And let's say everything goes perfect. We got the car loaded. We didn't forget anything. You know, we don't have any breakdowns or issues or run into a traffic jam and we're there in five, six hours. And then we check into the hotel you know, most of these got I me mean, think about all the responsibility and decisions that you've already had to make before you get to your destination. And then, you know, where are we going to go eat? What activities are we getting? I mean, it's very unlikely that dad's just getting to chill by the pool for a week or sit in his chair, you know, on the beach, reading a book, or it just, that's just not how most vacations go for men. Uh, and I'm, I'm, I'm not saying it goes much better for women because they're typically the ones that are dealing with the kids and, and all that stuff. But there's a big difference in going on a retreat where you're going to get picked up from the airport. You're going to get driven to your hotel. You're going to get checked into your room. Mm -hmm. And you have zero responsibility for anything other than showing up to the events. And even that, I, I hesitate to say this a little bit, but even that isn't mandatory. You're not going to get in trouble if you don't show up for a breathwork session or you miss a session. You know, typically we have these guys bought in enough uh, by the first, second day that they're not going to miss anything. Uh, unless it's something bit, you know, something out of their control. But yeah, for a lot of men, I think that's the most attractive part of something like this. Once they realize, man, this thing is, everything's taken care of. I don't have to think about anything. They pay for the retreat. Everything's included except for your flight. And all I got to do is show up. Yeah, it, it, you mentioned missing some things. Uh, I was actually just in Costa Rica several months ago in May, and uh, it was for some buddies that were throwing a men's retreat. And my roommate, one of my friends, he ended up getting sick, and he had to pretty much miss everything. And I think a lot of times it's the intelligence of the because I know this person too, um, and it's just my intuition. I could be wrong; it could be projection. But it, sometimes things like that happen because it needs to put us on our ass because we just need that rest, you know. And it's just yeah. learning to trust the process, go with the flow, and not be in resistance. With the decisions thing, though, what's fascinating is it makes me think of um, something I heard had to be like ten years ago or something about Mark Zuckerberg and a lot of different like uh, entrepreneurs or whatever, but people used to make fun of Zuckerberg for wearing the same thing every day. And he said, well, no, I do this because I don't have to make a decision. And I forget what the, what is it? One last thing to think about. Yeah. It's, it, uh, it's lost on me now what the science is behind it, but there's like science that backs it up that where people start to catch on to that and be like, Oh, one less thing to think about. And in terms of integration, like I could just imagine a week of, you know, just everything is taken care of, then coming back home, I'm not a father or anything like that. So I wouldn't have those sorts of responsibilities. But in the past of going on these month long immerse immersives, then coming back and integrating, what's helped me best is it kind of on a subconscious level, I didn't realize I was doing it till now, but set up certain things so I don't have to make as many decisions. Mm -hmm. So that's like that integration piece. So guys don't come back like super overwhelmed you know well that's also why we really really harp on implementing the morning routine mm -hmm. own your morning your morning is yours i don't care if you have to get up at 4 a.m it's worth it to get up before anybody else is up 
do your stretch, do your meditation, do your breath, whatever it is. But it, it needs to be something that isn't like, oh, fuck, I got to get up. And, you know, for some guys, that's like, I love working out. Like, gosh, man, you're 50, you're still in good shape, you you know, you work out all the time. Yeah, because I love to do it. If I didn't like doing it, I definitely wouldn't do it. I'm not that disciplined, right? I just happen to love working out and how I feel working out. So I've been doing it for since I was 16. The same thing with the morning practice. After the first like week of you getting up early and stretching and how good you feel after you stretch maybe you cold plunge maybe you you know meditate maybe you journal it doesn't it's not a maybe you do a body weight workout or maybe it is you going to the gym maybe you get up early do your morning stretch you do a walk around the block and you go to the gym but that's your time mm -hmm. right and and it's not the same if you know, you got to be at work at eight and you hurry and get up and try to run to a CrossFit gym and get your work in real fast and shower. And then you're, you're going to be late for work and you're cramming down. Like, again, it, it's an intentional owning of the morning. It's an intentional routine that you have set up that is like an appointment, like you don't miss. Like, obviously, sometimes things happen, you're sick, whatever, but you really try like, this is my time. I'm up before the kids, I'm up before my wife, whatever it is, where nobody can really take this away from me. And when you do that, the rest of the day just seems to flow. It seems to flow so much better because you're more likely to be more patient when you get to work and you get hit with something that you didn't expect or a shitty email or text that you get from your boss. Like, you're going to respond to it better because you're not starting the day in this fight or flight response that so many people, especially in Western culture, they start the day with a crazy alarm clock. Wah, 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 you know, and it's like, wow, oh, maybe they hit snooze a couple of times so they're hearing it multiple times and they get up and they make their coffee or they get a the shower they're getting the kids ready and you know it's out the door and fighting the traffic to get to where they go to the work and then they're you know and it's it's just a rinse repeat process day after day and they're living for the weekend they're living and dude i love football season that's definitely mm -hmm. what i'll do tomorrow like i'm not above all this stuff I hope it doesn't yeah. sound like I'm coming off because I'm, no. this is, this was me, is me like it's, but it, the, the one thing that you can control is your morning. If you make it worth that extra 30 minutes, the extra hour, whatever it is that you need to get up before the day really starts. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, I, I, uh, oh, keep going. Yeah. Yeah, that for us, that's that's one of the biggest things that we really try to implement on the retreat. Because again, we're not giving guys like a set prescription of things. We don't expect guys to go back and join a jujitsu gym or, you know, a, a CrossFit gym or what, you know, of course, health and fitness, we believe is a super integral part of being a man and feeling good and and you know, but we set up these things where we can start the day with these little wins where we feel like, okay, you know, we, you know, it's kind of like the making the bed, like yeah. making your bed every day. Right. It's like, all right, I did, I got a little win and I got something accomplished. If I do nothing else the rest of the day, at least I'm going to come back and my bed's made, but you know, setting up this container with all these different modalities and then letting guys mess those into their daily lives or wherever they are in the world, uh, whatever that looks like for them. Um, and then, you know, we have these bi-weekly calls where we're, we're right back into the circle. We do these, uh, these check-in circles. I'm sure you're familiar with where you do kind of a three word check-in just on where you are. Um, and then the men respond with, I see you and I hear you. We're not giving advice. We're not, you know, trying to, to pull a bunch of stuff out of you. We want to know what your three words are for today, this moment, this week, whatever it is. 
we look them in the eye, I see you and I hear you. And, and that's it. Cause a lot of times it's just the man acknowledging where he is at the moment. Mm -hmm. Where are you right now? And you could be happy and sad and triggered all in the same, you know, 10 second span. Um, but really just the guy owning that and saying, man, I'm, that jujitsu this morning kicked my ass and I'm, I'm feeling like, you know, I'm not as tough as I thought I was, or, Oh, I'm in, I'm out of shape. I got it. Like it, it, it's an honest moment where they're not having to project or put up this, you know, wall, you know, we're really just trying to create a space where guys feel safe to be themselves. Absolutely. I love that you brought that up too about the shares. I, I would love to add something to that. Before I do, if you guys are just listening and you're not watching on YouTube, I would totally encourage you to go to YouTube so you can see these howling monkeys that are playing behind Terry's head. I don't know if you've uh, noticed them on the camera, probably not, but uh, there's like a little family of them. So it's worth uh, checking it out to get transported into Costa Rica. If you're not already by this conversation, that said the shares, that's such a good piece. You know, I've been how I lead uh men's groups or any of my groups are three different kinds of shares, high level being one's open space. So like, you know, no reflections. That's what I want. Second is open to reflections, questions, feedback, advice, whatever. Third one is that's what I'm specifically seeking. I like the idea of just having two and simplifying it. That said, I've noticed when I'm a part of share groups where that's not said, like how you just said, like we're not giving feedback. If that's not said, um, then sometimes people end up having a vulnerability hangover because they have just, whether it's men or women, if it's yeah. co-ed or not, because you're expecting something more or maybe you didn't realize you were expecting something more, but it feels so empty to just have it received as I see you, I hear you, thank you for sharing. It's like, wait, what? So when you put the uh, anticipation or the expectation ahead of time, like, hey, you're not going to get feedback, that's so important because then your subconscious operates from a different place, you know? For sure, for sure. And I think, you know, there are times where, we do say, are you open for feedback or can I, you know, give you my perspective? Um, but for the most part, you know, especially as men, and this is a big thing of mine. So this is me talking about me in this moment. You know, I'm a, I'm a fixer. I love to give my wife a hard time and tell her she loves to give me unsolvable problems. That's like her, you know, that's like her hobby because she knows I want to fix everything. And some things just aren't meant to be fixed in that moment. You know, some things are meant to be sat in for a little bit, right? To really like hold and to understand and to feel and, and you know, just like my arm, like, yeah, it was probably the universe saying, hey, bro, you're 50, maybe basketball twice a week, jujitsu four times a week, gym five days a week, you know, plus all the uh, whatever in between, you know, maybe slow down a little bit. Or if you're not going to slow down, sleep more or eat better or or whatever it is. Like, I don't know what the message was. Um, it's going to be hard for me to slow down, but definitely it has made me more grateful and have more gratitude that I can still do a lot of the things that I love to do. Uh, and maybe that's it. Maybe it's just like, man, this sucks because I can't do all those things for the next three months. So how much sweeter is it going to be when I, when I get to do them again, I'm not going to take it for granted. Yeah. Um, but in those moments of, we're really just trying to get, when I started doing it here in Costa Rica, especially this meant the culture of men in Costa Rica, they're super proud you know, machismo guys, tough. Um, but a lot of them are like mama's boys, you know, they love their moms and, and, but they, they, when it comes to like, I do this free community class for boxing every Thursday. And my one rule was I'm going to do the class for free, but we have to have circle uh, at the end. So when I started this and just getting these guys to say three words, like any three words was 
like a like a challenge right there would just be like uh, the ticos or transplants ticos oh wow like feliz feliz tranquilo (laughs) like it was like every day and I'm like, come on. So, but by the third or fourth or fifth class, these guys start being vulnerable and start, and again, they're not getting, you know, we're not fixing anything for them, but just for them to acknowledge the fact that, man, I'm tired or I'm, I'm triggered or I'm upset or I'm sad or I'm, I'm really happy. I got this promotion, like just acknowledging these feelings that they're having in a culture where that's really not something that happens. Yeah. You would know better than me. Cause like just me visiting, right? Like I, I feel like everyone's just so happy there. And I, I didn't get that vibe in Bali. Like I, I don't mean to bring up Bali and talk trash yeah. again, but it was definitely a lesson for me in terms of expectations. Um, It's just so different out there in Costa Rica. Like, it seems like everyone is is happy. Maybe they're not sharing their feelings, but like it is really per vida, yeah. you know. And what's the other one? Twenties, is that it? Twenties, acachete. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, those are all the all the terms. But that's one of the reasons when I moved to Costa Rica, there were a few people who were like, "Man, you know," especially when they find out there's not, you know, like they're asking you, you know, like, "No, nah, there's not really that much going on." Uh, they're like, why do you want to move there? And I'm like, because I'm con- like, the people that live here are just happier. Yeah. Right. The people that are visiting are happy because they're on vacation. So I'm literally surrounded by happy people all day, every Holy. day, for the most part. Like that's super. And at the time in the in the COVID universe, like yeah. that was a, such a stark contrast to what I was feeling in the u.s so for me it was like man i just as soon as i would land in laveria and get off the plane it was like oh this <laughs> yeah. feeling like yes because you pass by guys on the on the road that are making two or three dollars an hour holding a stop sign for you know our traffic cones and they're laughing and with each other and joking and smiling and you know uh I just, I think one of the biggest reasons for that is in their culture, you really don't see the um, keeping up with the Joneses. Right. There's it, no, uh, it's quality of life. And this is just me being an outsider observing in because like I have so many fears that have kept me from moving to Costa Rica but that would be my dream right like you mentioned the mold you mentioned cars not going to start once a week um, uh, all kinds of different stuff that will come up and we'll just take one of those the car not starting for the most part like that's not the same problem that it is out here in the US because it's right. a different quality and a different pace of life and different commitments in a lot of ways as well. And it's understood more like, so it's, it's interesting because I, I think um, what we're getting at here in, in terms of like the keeping up with the Joneses and the consumerism, the Amazon packages not being able to be delivered. Right. And the materialism and there's so much like it just comes down to quality of life and realizing we don't need all of those things. And can we just live without them and be happier? And, you know, it seems from the outside in that the answer is yes, you know? So, yeah. Yeah. It is a buzzword, but the matrix is a real thing. Yeah. Uh, And it's hard to escape because it is pretty awesome. Yeah. You know, the matrix isn't hard to get out of because it sucks. I mean, the matrix is, things on demand, anything I want, when I want it, you know, uh, food, comfort, convenience, like not having to wait for, you know, something longer than 24 hours or, you know, being able to just jump in the car, you know, no, not thinking, oh, my car probably won't start. Mm -hmm. Right. (laughs) Like probably I have a flat tire. I mean, there is, Two weeks ago, I had three flat tires and tires in a week. Damn, you know, and I mean, I can get it patched for like four dollars, so which wow. is amazing. But I still have to get it patched, right? Mm-hmm. So it's it's, um, you know, it's just the things where it 
forces you, I think what Costa Rica and countries like Costa Rica do is they force you to slow down Mm -hmm. because you slow down in those, in those moments where you're forced to slow down and you're forced to be quiet and you're forced to not be in a hurry and you're forced to fuck listen to nature and you're forced to you know take your time that's the moments when you're like oh man life really is beautiful Mm -hmm. this world really is an amazing place because in the chaos and the busyness and the you know like you said the keeping up with the joneses all you really think about is what you don't have yeah it's all fear yeah haven't achieved and you know who who has more than you and well i'm going to be happy when i get x when i get to this there's a, a short story by robert Cummings that i love called the station and it basically is just talking about being on the train thinking okay when i get to x i'm going to feel y but there's really no station there's no ultimate end thing that you're going to get to no promotion no job no relationship no house no car whatever it is maybe for a fleeting moment you have that dopamine hit and you get that excitement and then it's gone and we got to find the next thing so i think really what i could say costa rica has done for me is it's made me appreciate the journey more than the destination it's like looking into a mirror. You're taking the words out of my mouth. I'm going to email you the TED talk I did earlier this year. I think you'll love okay. it. And guys, I'll, it'll be in the show notes too, if you want to check it out. Well, as we start to wrap it up here, Terry, um, Casa Kismet, is that how you say it? Yeah. Uh, Casa- that's, Kismet kind of means like synchronicity, right? Is that the word? Yeah. Kismet is fate, destiny, things yeah. are as the be i i named it that because of i looked for a year and a half the very first place i looked at is right next door um and for for whatever reason we couldn't get in to see this one and then a year and a half later i came right back to here and i walked out on the balcony and looking at the ocean i was like this is it and it's two houses so it's casas kismet or houses of destiny or, or things are as they should be I love that. Yeah. So guys, that's the name of the retreat center. And I want you guys to know as well that it's not just for men. Terry hosts all sorts of retreats there. His signature retreat personally is the balance man. But if you go to their website, it's in the show notes, you'll see a ton of different retreats out there. I think you have some women specific ones as well. And a lot of different ones, those, uh, it's called Radiate and Ride. So it's really just teaching women how to have fun. My wife surfs, skates, you know, does all that sort of thing. And they do yoga and, and ice baths. And I mean, they have a great time, um, you know, so, and it really, again, just teaching women how to have fun again. A lot of these are moms, you know, or, or, or you know, corporate, corporate execs that have just turned life. Life has become work. Mm-hmm. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Life has become work. You said it so well. So check out the show notes, see what Terry's up to the, the different retreats. If you feel called to it, I invite you guys to check it out, connect with Terry and I'm sure we'll do this again, Terry. I appreciate you coming on the pod and, and you uh, living and speaking your truth. And that's amazing. Yeah. I, I love it so much. Thank you so much.